If you know my name is Stephen Barry, I'm the clinical manager and lead clinician for a very small service in Bristol, which is part of the National Health Service City the NHS. Um, and we're part of the Child and Less Mental Health Service. Um, and my background is as a social worker and integrative psychotherapist, and I hold strongly to both traditions. I just pass to Louise. Hi everybody, my name's Louise Barraclough and I'm the Specialist Safeguarding Nurse for Devon and Cornwall Sexual Assault Referral Centres and we are the Paediatric Centre of Excellence for the South West Peninsula. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. Okay, so welcome. We're going to think about and quite quickly actually um, health responses to children and young people who have sexually harmed siblings. And, and think about their families also. We also are going to think about and consider the impact or potential influence of pornography. So just, we wanna focus on the context and linking to what you've already heard and I've always been rewriting my presentation as I've been listening. We're gonna think about practice models within the health se sector. I mean, Louise, do you want to come in now? Yeah, and we're going to look at acute health responses and non-acute health responses that quite often get lost in the chaos um, following disclosure or suspicion of sibling se sexual abuse and some practice implications and examples and also the impact on professionals, which lots of people have touched on today. So just briefly, and we don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you've heard a lot about this today, is just thinking about sexual behaviour along the continuum through to harmful behaviour, thinking about a range of factors that might increase or decrease the likelihood of the behaviour continuing, including both intrafamilial and extrafamilial factors, and we've heard a lot about those today. We also want to think about the lack of resources and consistent responses into addressing sexual abuse, including harmful sexual behaviour between siblings. And that we are, want to highlight, as you already know, the lack of coordinated response across agencies that work with those who have been harmed and those who harm. Uh, just to highlight a couple of points and then for Louise to come in with, we started by reflecting on what are the criminal justice responses that we know of. Um, Louise, do you want to come in and talk to this? Yeah, so, so we, we see this a lot, a, re, a really he real heavy reliance on the criminal justice process following disclosures of sibling sexual abuse. And actually the low conviction rate for sexual offences, you will all have seen the new figures were released last week. And now actually the charges and prosecutions are now less than 1.3%. So we can reliably assume that the conviction rate is pretty much microscopic. Um, so that's the context that we're working in. The, the data, which also people have touched on today, the Office of National Statistics, the 16 and 17 year olds are held in the adult data, not even in the child sexual abuse data. And there is no data on the age of the person who's harmed. And there are some really vague definitions of who the person who's harmed is. They, they fall into vague categories like other family member. Um, there are some really significant delays, often no intervention while there's an ongoing investigation. And there's a real over-reliance by agencies on the criminal justice outcome, and which very often doesn't lead to a prosecution because of what they call evidential difficulties. And that doesn't mean that, that it didn't happen, but other agencies take that to mean that it didn't happen. And it creates a real vacuum um, within which nothing happens for the child or young person who's harmed. And in the study that I did for the older age group, out of all of the young people who'd harmed, they were unequivocally at the end of the abusive slash violent end of the continuum. But for 70 percent of them, no agency spoke to them at all. And this has real consequences for the children who've been harmed. Move on to the next slide. So, so we're going to talk about health responses as one sector. We've also heard about the independent sector or thirds. And I think it's a phrase Simon Hackett used many, many years ago on a um, file on fall program, the idea of a postcode lottery. And it is very much about a postcode lottery. Even in my own area in Bristol, there's a different level of service within Bristol than there is in our neighbouring authorities within North Somerset and South Gloucestershire, for example. 
In some localities, responses are well coordinated between health, children's social care and youth offending teams and the independent sector. But there is clearly a lack of coordination across services for those who have harmed and those who have harmed. Just a couple of very quick examples and rather crudely put, so the team I lead on is an example of a multidisciplinary, multi-agency service with direct accountability to the Keeping Bristol Safe Partnership, which is the former safeguarding board. And there is another service, the one that Andy works for, is also a health-based service. I'm also aware of another model within a neighbouring authority, which is a consultation-only model from the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service to Children's Social Care and Youth Offending Service. So very varied responses across areas and even within localities. Louise. So a little quick thing about sexual assault referral centres and particularly paediatric services. Um, in, in our area, we cover a large geographical area which covers four different local authorities. And it's really important that you connect as professionals with your local SARC because they are the single point of contact for all of the wraparound care for children. But also, it's very important that in the initial strategy discussions, you include SARCs because there may be acute and time limited health care that's needed for children who have been harmed. There's also non-acute wraparound health care and, and feedback from, from people who have been harmed is that they find it really reassuring to have had an examination and be told everything's okay, nobody's going to know this has happened to you if you choose not to tell them. Um, and it's really important as well to consider the child or the young person who has harmed because we know that a large percentage of them, sometimes some studies show 50% of them have been sexually abused themselves and they need care themselves too. Um, do you want to move on to the next slide? Yep. So what I did was I looked at the potential relationship between easily available online adult pornography and harmful sexual behaviour broadly in children and young people. And I looked at four months last year and it was a total of 463 children were referred into our service. And of those children, 182, 39% of our activity was where harmful sexual behaviour was identified. And that was a broad definition where the child or the young person who'd harmed was under the age of 18. I did a deep dive in collaboration with one local authority in the police force. And this showed that 23 of those who harmed were under the age of 12 and 63 of them were 13 and over. And there were two, those two age groups, it was very distinctive into what the harmful sexual behavior looked like and how agencies were responding. Next slide. So a little bit about pornography. Um, those of you who've done any research or know anything about it will, will understand um, that it's very, it doesn't look like people think it looks like. And mention of pornography was identified in 16% of the records of those who harmed. And all of those, those who'd harmed were male and their ages ranged from six to 17 with the average age of 11, which we know is the, the most common age to start exposure to or watching pornography. And these were cases where the children had volunteered information or parents and carers had discovered exposure. There was no evidence that any children had been asked by professionals. So I went back and looked at the data and I looked at acts commonly seen in mainstream pornography. And I found this in 29% of the 87 deep dive accounts. So I saw slapping, non-fatal strangulation, choking, gagging, hair pulling, name calling, where the victim used the, used the word rough, anal penetration and penetration of both the vagina and the anus with objects. And in those accounts, 36% of those acts were seen in the younger age group and 64% in the older age group. Next slide. I went back <clears throat> for the purpose of this conference, I went back and looked specifically at sibling abuse. And in the three to 12 age group, three quarters of the victims were either siblings, so over 40%, combining siblings, half siblings and step siblings, or they were friends. And it looks very different in the 13 to 17 age group, 
where partners, friends and peers account for 80% of the harmful sexual behaviour. More than half of the behaviour occurred in the homes and all cases of sibling abuse occurred in the home. And it's worth noting the difference in the sex split. Broadly in harmful sexual behaviour, the, vi the, the victims, 80%, 87% of them were female and 13% male. Those who had harmed, 96% were male and 4% were female. But in sibling abuse, which accounted for 23% of the total cases, the victims were almost split in half. 59% were female, 41% male. And those that harmed looked pretty similar. Next slide. So research shows us that children and young people are telling us that they're using pornography as a form of instruction and sex education. And what I found in this study is that as professionals, we're not exploring that with them. And where the professionals did have conversations, they felt they were really welcomed by and helpful for the children and young people. Um, in the cases of sibling abuse, pornography was identified in 37.5% of cases which is higher than the 29% broadly. And I can't make any big claims about that because it may well be that the sibling abuse occurred in the younger age group more often, and there was more professional inquiry in that age group. 41% of the sibling abuse had a history of child sexual abuse or a registered sex offender within their family network. And 25% had a history or current domestic abuse. And I think that was probably much higher because for a lot of the children who'd harmed, there was nothing written about that. The impact on the victims is, was really telling. We see this coming through our therapy service, them saying they wish they hadn't told anyone, they felt like it was their fault. The overriding theme was that they did not feel believed by family or professionals. And also, again, alluding to the reliance on the criminal justice process, that victims have been told by professionals that they can't carry on saying this has happened to them because it's not fair to label him when police say there is not enough evidence. And a lot of um, children who've been harmed trying to navigate their social networks afterwards with a lot of teasing and bullying. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about the Be Safe service. Um, just to give you an example of a model within the health sector um, within the UK. So Be Safe works with children and young people up to the age of 17 who have harmed sexually. We provide consultation, training, assessment and therapeutic intervention. And as I said, we're a multidisciplinary team. We also work within the context of a joint multi-agency harmful sexual behaviour protocol, which in Bristol we're currently um, reviewing, and that could be made available to people if they're interested. So as the diagram there suggests, we offer therapeutic intervention, both individual and family, based on an assessment process, which I'll talk about shortly. We also offer group interventions. We deliver an evidence-based trauma-focused CBT program developed by Oklahoma University's Health Sciences Centre, which we were funded to replicate through the big lottery in 2012 for five years. That works with the children and their parents and carers. Alongside that, we also deliver in collaboration, we've developed a program with Kent University Tizard Centre, a group and family intervention for young people with mild to moderate learning disabilities. And as you heard earlier today, a disproportionate number of referrals are those for young people with additional needs, including learning disabilities, as well as neurological developmental difficulties, including autism. Um, and that program draws draws a range of psychoed resources together alongside um, therapeutic approaches very, draw very strongly from narrative approaches and externalization as Andy referred to earlier and something called the good way model which was developed by someone called Leslie Ayland and Bill West in New Zealand and uses this idea is that we all have a good side and a bad side and, a, and how our thinking has influenced our decisions how our feelings influence our decisions and how our circumstances so it's very much around making safe choices along and it aims to address concerns but also develop strength factors we also link very strongly with circles of support and accountability which offer a group of volunteers to support young people in the community in the southwest um, they also develop and offer that service to adults um, we also have a strong emphasis around considering restorative approaches and i am going to talk very shortly about 
of the Restore project, uh, which was a collaboration between the Greenhouse and Bristol, um, which delivers services for children, young people and adults who have experienced sexual abuse, ourselves and our Bristol Youth Offending Service. That's just very much a snapshot of the kind and range of services we offer. So on the data, um, based on our, we create an annual report um, and we have a range of statistics and material in there, which gives us information on the young people and children we work with. And I think that's really important to informing policy, strategy, service delivery. Um, so as you can see, 72% are male, 28% are female. If I'd talked to this, say, five years ago, it most probably would have been 10% female and 90% male. So that demographic is changing, interestingly. Referral age from 5 to 16, with the most common age being 15, followed by ages 9 to 10. 82% of the young people and children we work with have experienced some form of abuse, and in some cases, multiple abuse. Most lived with their parents, and then followed by foster care and then kinship care arrangements. Many, 32%, had additional needs. And in terms of ethnicity, um, 88% described themselves as British and 12% is from BME backgrounds. Um, I could give a fuller break, breakdown, but for brevity, I've chosen to do that rightly or wrongly. Um, the range of behaviours included sexual touching, primitive acts, technology, internet behaviours, and appropriate sexual language. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the growth in the internet and technology-assisted harmful behaviours. And the majority had harmed either friends or peers, followed by siblings. So once again, is the importance of considering sibling sexual abuse. Just very briefly, and I can't do this justice, um, is we use a range of assessment frameworks and approaches, including AIM3 that someone referred to, the under 12s AIM framework. We also used a formulation type approach where we'll do a, a formulation with colleagues within services like social care to think about what are the factors that are contributing to this behaviour? What is this behaviour telling us about this child or young person's experience? We consider the importance of race, class and culture within that. We need to consider the importance of racism, uh, trauma as a result of racism and discrimination. We use trauma-informed and collaborative approaches. We place a strong emphasis on working with the whole family system. So as a service, we will not just take a referral for a child. We will work with the child and the young person, but also their family. Hence, for our service, we have a systemic family therapist as part of our multidisciplinary team, alongside a psychologist, social workers, um, counselling and therapeutically trained staff. We emphasise the importance of multi-agency and collaborative working. And when we receive a referral, if it does meet our criteria, we'll initially start with a multi-agency meeting that may include parents, carers, and draw up a plan and think, do we go on to a fuller assessment? Do we need to do just a very focused assessment? Or as a, or as a consultation and support to someone already working with a child or young person, a better approach? So we create a range of approaches within that and agree a plan. And as part of that process, right at the beginning, we're asking about safety plans, risk management plans, and we, we offer a range of templates and guidance around creating safety plans in different contexts. An example of one of those would also include um, one based on social stories, for example, for young people with learning disabilities and for younger children, that can be really helpful. And as we suggest here, we emphasise the importance of creating safety, trust, offering choice, working collaboratively, and empowerment through strength-based approaches while still addressing risk and concern factors. So we need to also be realistic. Just a little about the trauma approaches and Chrissy's comments were really helpful and powerful. And I think there's some learning for those who work particularly in the harmful sexual behavior field of the importance of drawing from a broad range of approaches. And there are a range of manualized approaches out there as well, which we use, but we adapt them according to the need of the child, young person and family. So it's not rigid. It needs to be flexible based on need and based on the assessment. And as I've suggested there, it needs to address concern and strength factors. It needs to take into account cultural needs, for example, learning needs, faith-based needs. We need to think about the needs of the child harmed as well as those that are harmed, as well as their parents, carers, siblings and the broader family system. So it is complex work. 
it's important we work with the child support network. And we often do a lot of work alongside the school, for example, because children and young people are often at risk of exclusion in these cases. And our education colleagues need support to address those concerns to come up with appropriate um, risk risk management plans, safety plans, for example. Our, our, our work is informed by a process of assessment and constant review and underpinned by risk management and safety planning. And as I've said, can include individual group and family therapy and a range of approaches, including systemic, trauma-focused, cognitive behavioural therapies and psychoeducational. And more recently, my team have also, some of my team have been trained in developmental Didactic developmental psychotherapy um, developed by Dan Hughes, which is very much an attachment-based approach, particularly helpful working with foster care placements, but also with parents where attachment is of concern. And also so important right from the beginning to develop collaborative approaches that emphasize safety and that there's an agreed therapeutic plan. Just a brief note on safety planning, and I won't go into lots of detail on this because not having time, I think I've touched on that. But one of the key things I would be thinking about is that it needs to be collaborative, joined up, it needs to be shared on a who needs to know basis, it needs to be reviewed and adjusted um, based on the change in circumstances, but it also needs to be specific about practicalities. So statements like someone should be supervised 24-7 is unrealistic when you consider it, for example, it's a single parent. What happens if you need to go to the toilet, et cetera, et cetera. And reviewing and adjusting is really important. And as I've listed there, there's a range of areas to address, including contacts with a broad range of family members and others, different contexts that the child may be active in. Just briefly, the Restore Project is a collaboration, as I said, between the Greenhouse Be Safe and the Bristol Youth Offending Team. And as part of that, we developed a range of referral protocols, guidance for introducing restorative approach, parent care information, assessment frameworks, and client questionnaires. Our referral forms include a question for the Greenhouse and for us about Restore and about um, sharing information. And we have a quarterly meeting with the clinical lead for the greenhouse where there's a crossover in children. So they'll work with the child who's been harmed, we'll work with the child who's harmed. So we're looking for a systemic and joined up approach. Also, it's, so that guidance is available and the assessment framework is available. In developing that, we drew very much from some of the ideas of the AIM project in the UK, which somebody referenced earlier. This is from an evaluation of the project. And I think it's, it distinguishes it from other types of restorative projects. Restore uses a restorative justice approach as opposed to the traditional restorative justice practice, which in many cases concludes with an RJ meeting. An RJ meeting is only one possible destination for the work. So I think that's really important. There may be no such meeting, and often there isn't. There might be an exchange of letters and so forth, or there may be no contact at all. With the children and families in the restore pilot, the work continued with a focus on family and the integration only if indicated that goes beyond the instance of sexual harm. In other words, we're considering a range of factors, not just the harmful sexual behaviour. Restore staff talk about working with restorative justice approach in mind. This has led to a more systemic approach across agencies and working with sibling sexual abuse, abuse with improved outcomes and partnership working. I think that's really important. And it's that, that idea that one size does not fit all. It's a very considered approach that takes into account the needs of the child harmed, which leads the process, the child who's harmed, and all the other family members as well. So we heard that mentioned before when someone referenced ripple effects. Um, throughout the day, people have talked about case studies, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But... The cases are diverse within the service. So this is a young person with a moderate learning disability who'd sexually abused his sister. They'd all both experienced sexual abuse from a stepfather and exposed to domestic abuse. They now live separately. As part of the process, they both accept, went through, have, have worked through a therapeutic process. There is now uh, assessed, sorry, supervised contact, which was assessed using the framework I mentioned and some exchange an apology letter written by Jim and shared in a supported way with his sister, Abby. 
another case of a young person, Joel, 16, harmed his 13-year-old sister, continues to blame his sister. So this is an initial assessment. Pornography was significant in this case, and he appears still to be very um, controlling. So we're having to agree with social care and the broader network and the parents about safeguards in place, about the children not having contact. So that's the beginning of a process. Louise. So those of you, I can see lots of stuff going into the chat about Gail Dine's work, and she was heavily involved in this in this research. Um, you'll know that that children searching for things on the internet get catapulted onto places like Hawk Pornhub. And I saw this in the 12 and under age group come up over and over again, searching for sexy things, seeing porn on friends' phones at school and that kind of stuff. And I think what's really important that a lot of feedback from the social workers was that, that um, children were, were seeing this at school. And this is a kind of conflation of lots of other, lots of children that, that he said he knows he's not meant to watch porn and his parents have made sure that there are parental controls on his phone and his tablet. And he says he won't even try and look at it at home, but he says all of his friends hotspot their phones in the playground at school and they all watch porn together at break time. He says if he doesn't watch it with him, he can't be part of the friendship group and he can't tell them that he's not meant to watch it. And I find this really interesting because it's, the, it's no longer a choice for this boy because he's at a developmental stage where if he doesn't fit into his peer group, it's social death. So this emphasis on individual children having to say we shouldn't be watching that is, is impossible for them. And I think that there, there really is a socio-cultural context here that needs to be addressed. There's a real elephant in the room here. Next slide. So just briefly, we've heard about this throughout the day, the importance of being mindful of professional support, training, impact, and monitoring that in ourselves. Being mindful that you're in a room, people will have different attitudes, assumptions, and feelings. There's a sense sometimes of being pulled in both or multiple directions. These situations can be extremely anxiety provoking for professionals, yet alone families, parents, carers, young people. We can sometimes get overwhelmed with a sense of hopelessness, and that within the professional network, as I said, we could take different positions. Professionals may also minimize concerns and in some cases overreact to concerns. Also be mindful that we may mirror the family dynamics within the professional network. So if you like a parallel process, consider the impact of trauma, for carers trauma, secondary trauma. And we've also heard today about the importance of reflection, balance, supervision, and ongoing training. If I had said everything I Sorry. wanted to in the session, I would have fallen to pieces. Sorry, people able to hear that? Yes. Uh, yeah. people able, Louise, are people able to hear that? I can't yes, Everybody, everybody's saying yes in the chat bar. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is briefly share the words of three different people, the child who's harmed, the carer, and the word of, of someone who's been harmed. Um, they're read out by members or former members of the Be Safe team. And I just wish to acknowledge Johnny, Laura, and Amelia for doing that for us. So that's where I want to finish our words. Oops. Oh, sorry. This process gave me a chance to sort out the stuff in my head, the sexual stuff family stuff. It takes time to build trust and safety. I worried about my sister's reaction. I thought she might be angry. I was nervous when I saw my sister. I was worried she'd reject me. I mean, I'd not seen her for two years. But I was given plenty of time. I had support to prepare my apology letter with all my words in it. I felt like people trusted me and pushed me, which helped me to open up. I wouldn't change the process at all.
Uh, these are words from a carer. Ordinary stuff too. The Be Safe process allowed for closure for us as a family. It was really helpful for us to have a goal to work towards. I was always invited to come in at the end of the sessions, which was vital to make sure that we were always working in the same direction. This also meant that on the way home, we were able to have really good conversations. It made it possible for my son to talk to me about difficult things. My son was really nervous and scared before the first couple of sessions. They prepared him really well though, and the sessions were a mix of talking about hard stuff and then ordinary stuff too. They made it feel safe so he could relax. Coming to the end of our work with Be Safe, I could see the pride on his face. He hadn't recognised how far he had come. The world has opened up for him. He can do anything now. And the last words to someone who has been through a therapeutic process, not within our service and other service. If I had said everything I wanted to in the session, I would have fallen to pieces. The impact you have had on my life is more than you could possibly know, and I am so extremely grateful. You've been so kind, loving and caring to me, and you've helped me treat myself that way too, which is going to help me for the rest of my life. I was in so much pain when we first started, and to think how much you've helped me is hard to comprehend. It gives me so much comfort to know that you do this for so many people. You genuinely make such a powerful difference in the world. What a wonderful thing to think about. Just let those words sink in. Louise, do you want to finish with this slide? Yeah. I suppose we need, we need coordinated and re well resourced services to address this and I th hopefully lots of people go away today and start making enough noise to try and get them commissioned. Um, the needs and the safety of the child who has harmed must be addressed alongside the child who has been harmed, their parents, their carers and their si other siblings and family members. Families need time and opportunity to make sense of the trauma of it all. And we all as professionals need ongoing support and training when we're working within this field. And I suppose from a SARC perspective and from a health perspective, I would just reiterate in the chaos and the grenade as it's been referred to today many times, don't forget the acute health needs or the non-acute health needs of both the children who've been harmed and those who have harmed. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've included a range of resources and links in our presentation alongside references. Um, so thank you for taking the time to listen and join us.